1986 New Orleans Saints highlights are brought to you by New York Life and its 9,500 agents and representatives who offer you quality financial products and services to help you get the most out of life. Since 1975, the focal point of downtown New Orleans has been the Louisiana Superdome. In 1986, pro football's most faithful supporters returned to greet a new edition of their favorite team and cheer it on toward that elusive first winning season. The true saints of the Superdome have always been the fans. In 1986, New Orleans had reason for hope in the form of first-year head coach Jim Mora, enthusiastic owner Tom Benson, and the confidence of a team on its way up. Actually, the 86 season would have its ups and downs. A roller coaster ride that saw the Saints stay in playoff contention through 14 weeks, only to have their dreams snatched away at the threshold of success. Through it all, the new coach kept his cool. Mora saw steady improvement as his first NFL team worked its way through the tight spots, then turned the corner and headed in the right direction while learning a new dance along the way. And it's time to crank up the Benson boogie and exhorting the fans. <laughs> it sort of looks like Jackie Gleason on the Honeymooners, doesn't it? The Benson boogie sprang spontaneously from a contagious excitement that had Fleur de Lis flying and helped unite an entire state and its team. This new feeling in the Superdome air was all about the future and what it takes to win. The 1986 season began with apprehension. 1985 had seen the Saints fall six full games off the pace in the NFL's Western Division. This trend was about to end with a push from behind by a new head coach. His name, Jim Mora. Mora arrived in New Orleans with a winning reputation that earned him instant acceptance into the NFL coaching fraternity. With back-to-back -back USFL championships to his credit, Mora was a proven peer with a tested formula for success. I'm not against criticizing them whenever I think it's necessary. I think that the important thing is to be consistent with your players so that they know where you're coming from and where they stand. And I think it's very important that you be fair, but also at the same time be firm with them. He um, demands a lot out of you. He doesn't take anything for granted. His way of motivating the player, making sure he does every play right. His winning attitude in general. We all know what Mr. Moore, Coach Moore, Sir, whatever you want to call him, wants now. We can go out there and work hard to give it to him. He's a real stickler for details, and he just makes sure that everything is covered going into the game. He wants to be as well prepared as he possibly can. And I think that carries over to the team, the discipline part of it, and the, the being prepared. And that makes you going into the game more confident of what your assignments are, more confident of what the team is going to be able to do. He hasn't changed one bit. He ran the organization in the USFL exactly the same way he's running this organization because he knows uh, that's the way he can win. We had a system with the stars that we had developed over a period of three years, and we basically brought that system to the Saints. They brought a positive winning attitude there, proving that they could win. Wherever they've been, they've been winners. Mora's hand-picked staff included Steve Walters and Steve Sidwell and a Baltimore Stars contingent of John Pease. Dom Capers, Vic Fangio, Joe Marciano, Carl Smith, Jim Skipper, and holdover Russell Paternostro. These men, plus the leadership of St. President General Manager Jim Finks, gave New Orleans instant access to a new talent pool. From the other league came number 53, Vaughn Johnson, who made an immediate impact at linebacker while Antonio Gibson threw his weight around at strong safety. 
At 6'3 and 205 pounds, number 27 was big enough to overpower a play before it got started and quick enough to make the safety blitz a New Orleans specialty. But the biggest USFL prize came in the smallest package. 5'9 Sam Mills played way over his head at inside linebacker and stepped right into a starter's role using brains instead of brawn and instinct instead of inches to get his hard-hitting job done. Soon, Sam Mills was holding his own with the big boys of the NFL and helping his team toward an aggressive new era of Saint defense. The new addition sparked every aspect of the New Orleans resurgence, including the game-breaking excitement of return specialist Mel Gray, who set an all-time New Orleans record with a 101-yard kickoff return against the 49ers. To the 30, to the 40, he's got room to midfield, he's still on his feet and it's a foot race. Nobody's going to catch him! Mel Gray's going all the way for the touchdown! Mora's explosive underground railroad supplemented the New Orleans draft, which added two fresh faces to the St. Rushing game. Second pick, Dalton Hilliard, and third choice, Reuben Mays. Hilliard's versatility made him a valuable addition to the St. offense. Whether throwing for a touchdown or running for one, the former LSU star displayed polished skills far beyond his years as he darted for over 400 yards rushing and followed his blockers for five touchdowns during 1986. While Hilliard came to the Saints complete, Mays arrived via the unlikely outpost of North Battleford, Saskatchewan. He was a rare find, a Canadian kid who picked football over hockey, then set his sights on the NFL. When he joined the Saints, Mays still had a lot to learn, including how to set up his blockers instead of running by them. But the natural skills of number 36 were too numerous to ignore. His balance and instinctive ability to maneuver in the open field and his strength and quickness in slashing off tackle marked Reuben Mays as one of a kind. With an improving offensive line and more as H-back attack, Mays learned how to tuck in behind a slipstream of blockers and use his raw talent to maximum advantage. Before long, Saint fans were beating the drum for the sleeper who would become everyone's Rookie of the Year. By year's end, this long shot from the north led the world in rookie rushing with 1,353 yards and eight touchdowns. It's a long way from North Battleford to the Pro Bowl, but Reuben Mays made it look easy. Seven. They'll sweep it to this side with Mays. He's going to reverse his field at the 30. He's got room around the far sideline. Wilson's going to throw a block. Mays is going to go all the way for the touchdown. Jim Moore also inherited quality. Veteran Saint kicker Morton Anderson led the entire NFL in field goal percentage by converting on 26 of 30 attempts from near and far. Number seven was named all pro for both his accuracy and his distance. Anderson's kickoffs flew high and deep, providing Saint special teams with the chance to make the big play. Anderson's influence rubbed off on returning St. punter Brian Hansen. Number 10's hang time increased and St. coverage teams took advantage. 
Big hitters included Brett Maxey, Pat Swilling, Joe Colbrand, Dana McLemore, Jack Del Rio, and Bobby Johnson. But the biggest hitters of all were the veteran leaders of the New Orleans defense. Linebacker Ricky Jackson and number 75, Bruce Clark, who anchored the defensive line. Clark is the rare example of a big man who is equally adept at crushing a run at the line of scrimmage or slip sliding his way to a quarterback sack. As resident St. All Pro, number 57 once again led New Orleans in both sacks and tackles with a style that left no room for compromise. Ricky Jackson simply went all out in every game on every play. Whether meeting a play head on or chasing it down from behind, there was not a more consistent linebacker in the NFL than Ricky Jackson. And against the Falcons in Atlanta, he simply dominated. Jackson destroyed the Falcons with 12 solo tackles and four quarterback sacks including one on the game's final play to preserve a 14-9 New Orleans victory. Jim Mora's blend of old and new gave the Saints a new image, and opponents that run-down feeling. In 1986, the Saints got bad and nasty, and not coincidentally, set a New Orleans record for takeaways in one season with 43. But all this heavy hitting took place in the structure of team defense. Team defense meant putting a maximum of black and gold around the ball on every play. Team defense meant knowing your assignment on every play, like number 51, Sam Mills, keeping outside leverage and forcing a runner back into Ricky Jackson. Team defense allowed for individual brilliance, like that of number 97, Jumpy Gathers. Team defense meant a level of control that allowed New Orleans to outscore opponents for only the second time ever and give up the second fewest points in New Orleans history, including 14 game seasons. Now, New Orleans had a defense that could take charge. Against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, defensive lineman Jim Wilkes and Frank Warren led the way to five sacks. With the Superdome super fans cheering them on, the Saints forced three fumbles and recovered all three. Against Tampa Bay, Bruce Clark and the defensive line rumbled to a 38-7 win, while another home game against the Green Bay Packers saw the linebackers in secondary lead the way. Dave Waymer, Johnny Poe, Frank Watlett, Alvin Tolles, and James Haynes intimidated the Packer passing game, then picked it clean for seven interceptions and a 24-10 Saint victory. Straight back is Ferragamo, throwing up oh. the backfield, picked off by Haynes! 
While the defense came on strong, St. Offensive Fortunes kept getting stalled. Bobby Aver started the season with the promise of his long distance right arm. But when Aver was injured early in the year, veteran Dave Wilson was ready and waiting. Wilson's experience held the Saints steady in a time of flux, and his leadership and accurate passing kept the Saints in every game they played. Wilson's efforts were expected, the offensive line started out as a question mark. But as the year progressed, both quarterbacks benefited from the growing cohesion of Bill Kantz, Brad Edelman, Steve Court, Chuck Comiskey, and Stan Brock. Their protection increased the receiving opportunities of number 84, Eric Martin. Number 80, Herbert Harris. Number 86, Mike Jones. Tight ends John Tice, number 82. And Hobie Brenner, number 85. Wideouts, number 83, Calvin Edwards. And number 88, Eugene Goodlow. Saints passing potential was impressive, but balance was the ultimate goal. Excellent run blocking and Reuben Mays gave New Orleans one half the equation. When the Saints passing attack completed the other half, New Orleans was tough to beat. Against the St. Louis Cardinals, Wilson completed a touchdown pass to Mike Jones and Mays ran for 131 yards to spark a 16 to seven New Orleans win. In the Hoosier Dome, the Indianapolis Colts fell 17-14. This time, the pass was to Eric Martin. And fullback Buford Jordan did the honors on the ground. Against the New York Giants, Dalton Hilliard went over the top for a first half touchdown. And Dave Wilson staked the Saints to a 17-0 lead by going deep to Eric Martin. But the Giant game turned out to be a mini version of the Saints season of almost. In the second half, New Orleans self-destructed and lost to the eventual world champions 20 to 17. At times, Jim Morris' first season was a struggle, with injuries to key performers like Brad Edelman and first-round draft choice Jim Dombrowski. Then there were all those little pieces that didn't quite fit, as New Orleans' first winning season once again fell tantalizingly out of reach. One year was not enough to work out all the variables of victory. So once again, the Saint fans sat loyally by, grateful for the little things and waiting patiently for someone to lead them to the promised land. But for two weeks at least, the Saints stood tall with the best teams their division had to offer. In back-to-back -back home games against the Los Angeles Rams and the San Francisco 49ers, the Saints proved they were ready to compete for a title. <laughs> Leading the way was team defense, holding the Rams to 53 yards and the 49ers to 52 yards rushing.
Typically, the tough hitting led to turnovers, a total of eight for the two games. These two games turned out to be a microcosm for the Saints' whole season. Saint defense takes away the ball. Saint offense throws just enough to keep everyone honest. Then Saint offense turns the ball over to the meal ticket. Ruben Mays and the running game controlled the ball in both games. Morton Anderson kicked two field goals to beat Los Angeles 6-0. Mays scored twice for a 23-10 win over San Francisco. It is over. The Saints have won. There was no time left, and the Saints have beaten the Los Angeles Rams 6-0. Two thousand three hundred and fifty two fans on their feet and applauding this New Orleans Saints team at year's end the Saints of the Superdome were grateful and so were the players they're star for wins they deserve a team that will win and gosh they're probably the most faithful fans anywhere in America they hang in a little longer this could be the year we're trying to stress a commitment to winning, to doing what we feel is necessary to get some wins. If they can see some success from their hard work and efforts and this commitment, then, then I think the winning attitude develops and takes place. In 1986, the New Orleans Saints learned what it takes to win. In 1987, they hope to put that lesson to good use.